to all of you. I think after a series of excellent talks that we've been hearing in the afternoon, I stand here to present you some of the excellence of our own institute, ICT. And that's how I'm going to talk to you today about affordable excellence in nanomedicine. So what do I mean by affordable excellence? I think the best example of affordable excellence in today's context is the mobile phone. The mobile phone is available with every individual, be it the dood wala, chai wala, bhaji wala, or even the fool wala. So it is a gadget that is excellent, certainly we can't deny that. That is affordable and that is affordable excellence that has percolated across society. And that's why the word affordable attached to excellence. And that has happened because of the Android phone. But you also have the iPhone. Now if you compare the iPhone with the Android phone, you find that the Android phone has able to penetrate up to 30% of the market. But sorry, the iPhone has percolated up to 30% of the market, while the Android phone still acquires 70% of the market. But can one do without the iPhone? Yes, very well. Even with the Android, one could manage. But when I talk of affordable excellence in nanomedicine, is nanomedicine something like the iPhone? Yes, it's something that is that excellence in healthcare. But has it percolated 30% into the society? No. And that's what I'm going to talk about because it is this observation that nanomedicine is wonderful, it's available, but not available enough, which set us off on this journey of affordable excellence in nanomedicine to serve the underserved. So where did it begin? It began actually as a story of desperation. Why a story of desperation? I will come to as we move along. And before I tell you the story, I'll tell you why nanomedicine is important. So where did nanomedicine begin? It began years ago. It was way back in 1908 that Paul Ehrlich, who was a microbiologist, proposed the magic bullet. He said, if you can send a drug to a particular organ only, you will have the effect without the side effects. And there it stopped as a concept, as a principle, as a theory. But in 1959, you had Robert Fenman who proposed that there is plenty of room at the bottom and introduced nanotechnology. And Robert Fenman is called the father of nanotechnology. Paul Ehrlich is called the father of targeting. And together, nanomedicine was born. So it is the combination of the propositions of these two huge scientists that gave birth to nanomedicine. So now why nanomedicine? Why do we need nanomedicine? As you watch that slide, you see that something is happening there. And what is happening? It's actually cells taking up particles. So before I go there, let us just talk about healthcare. And let's talk about a disease all of us would understand, maybe tuberculosis. We all know it affects the lungs majorly. Lung tuberculosis is one of the worst diseases and none of us would like to have it. Lung tuberculosis needs treatment of three to four drugs to be given over a period of nine months. Can you beat it? And what is the challenge today in tuberculosis? Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, extremely drug resistant tuberculosis, which means there are no treatments available. For XDR, there is one drug that has been FDA approved today, but that's under such control because if that drug gets misused, we are all doomed. It may be worse than the COVID pandemic. But why is it that MDR has happened and XDR is happening? It's because of this nine month therapy with four drugs and three drugs that not only give you effect, but give you severe side effects. So while the drug goes to the lung and works in the lung, it also goes to the liver and damages the liver. It also goes to the kidney and damages the kidney. 
and when the liver is damaged your appetite is lost you don't live they say life is all about the liver functioning well so if your liver function is affected you don't feel your living and you feel better without the drug and that's what patients do quietly they stop taking the drug and that's where the challenge results so what do we need we need something that paul ehrlich proposed take the drug to the lung and that is what nanomedicine can do because nanomedicine can enter cells directly and the major challenge with diseases like tuberculosis is the organism the bacteria enters the cell and resides and hides in the cell and is protected by the cell membrane so if i have nanomedicine i can breach the cell membrane i can enter the way you see it happening in this slide and to how has this concept arisen it's arisen based on our physiology based on what the body is doing day in day out so today if all of us are sitting here happily enjoying all these talks it's because we are healthy you just had a talk on health but why are we healthy because in the body we have a defense system we call it as the res or the reticulo endothelial system which is like having a lineup of soldiers in the body that immediately swallow or engulf bacteria viruses parasites etc and today the mosquito delivering parasites into us has become such a big problem with the spread of dengue chikungunya malaria etc but we have this body defense if it works well it can protect us there are some times when it doesn't work so well and that's when we fall ill but nano medicine utilizes these same physiological principles of the body to engulf these foreign organisms because the body treats the nano particles that you send in as foreign organisms and they are quickly taken up by the cells so you're not doing something that is very new you're only trying to understand the physiology of the body and adapt it to make nano medicine effective there are a lot of challenges there are a lot of bridges that one needs to cross but nano medicine has advanced a lot and all that is happening so when we have nano medicines that is so excellent what is the challenge why is it that we don't see every patient who needs it being treated with nano medicine so before i say every patient who needs it let me qualify every disease doesn't need nano medicine but two huge disease categories one is cancer and the other is intracellular infectious diseases one is tuberculosis the other is hiv you have trypanosomiasis you have splenic tuberculosis and you have a host of infections in animals which are generally never even looked at so when you look at what is already there in the market you find that if you compare it with the conventional medicine it's right from 10 to 25 fold higher so if i just try to project some statistics to you paclitaxel is one drug that is very widely used for cancer therapy and that drug has got a 6 billion us dollar global market paclitaxel liposomal which is a nano medicine has a 1 billion dollar market but is it covering 1/6 of the requirement no because that 1 billion dollar total amount is a 25% extra cost it's 25 times more expensive than the conventional one which means it's 1 by 6 by 25 so you know the maximum outreach of nano medicine is barely 5% and even insurance companies world over are not covering nano medicine very readily the premiums are huge for nano medicine so this makes nano medicine almost inaccessible to the socio economically lower strata and you also have another challenge and that challenge is non availability it's not available even if people want to buy it and when did we see that during covid during covid all of you would have read about the black fungus mucormycosis that required amphotericin nano for treatment 
and it was not available even to people who could afford it. So nanomedicine is fantastic. It's very expensive. It's not available. So what is it that makes it so high cost? One is the raw materials that are used and the second is the technology that is used. So we decided to start off by looking at cheaper raw materials to bring down the cost using same technology. And we developed a fantastic product for a drug called buparvacone. Buparvacone is a drug that is used to treat a typical condition called thalariosis in cattle, not in humans. It's used in cattle and it is used to treat cattle who get this parasitic infection. Now we developed a formulation and in collaboration with the Veterinary Institute, we did clinical studies in infected cattle and we found our system working at one fifth the dose, giving very good efficacy with no recurrence occurring. And it was not even getting secreted in the milk, which means during treatment, the farmer could continue milking his animal. And if milking stops for a small farmer, probably one day his family starves. It's that bad. So it's very important to have such treatments even in the veterinary sector. So we developed this medicine, we showed efficacy and we were very lucky because we got a company who came and said, yes, we want to take this from you. And then came the challenge. When they said yes, we took the help of engineers and we said, okay, now we need to scale up. If it has to be passed on and technology licensed, we need to scale up and that's where the challenge was. But we told them it's a huge challenge, they still licensed it and took it from us, so that made it even worse. And I have gone through sleepless nights at that point of time. And it was one day morning that there was this Eureka moment and we developed what I call here as in situ nanotechnology. Now, why did we look at this? Because of all the challenges that you see there and two important challenges, scalability. You could make it at small scale, which we did to do all our clinical trials on a small scale and stability. Once we made it, those nanoparticles, all of you who are scientists here know they are very high energy particles because of their size and they tend to agglomerate so they don't remain nano for too long. So that was the second challenge. So we overcame all those challenges with in situ nanotechnology and what is in situ nanotechnology? Can you believe it? We have developed a beaker and glass rod nanotechnology. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you because it's difficult to believe, right? Now, what is this beaker and glass rod nanotechnology? We take whatever we want to put into the nanoparticles. Now, nanoparticles, when we say it has to have a carrier. So we take the carrier, we take the drug, plus a number of other excipients to get what we want in the final formulation. Everything has to be safe when it's for human or any kind of medical administration. All those aspects have been looked at. And we just put everything in and it's like stirring with a glass rod in the lab, but on a large scale, you can just put it into a tank and a stirrer, stir it. Of course, we need to sterilize it, which we can do by filtration because it's a simple solution. So that again is something the industry can do very, very easily. So now with that, what did we do next? We had this preparation done and you can see here live how it works. Now what you see in that vial is actually what was prepared using the beaker and glass rod technology which the industry has to do. That is withdrawn. It is then added to dextrose injection, which is widely available in the market in different volumes. Whatever volume you want, you will get it in the market. You just need to buy that, add this into that, and you have ready to inject drug-loaded nanoparticles, which match the conventional formulation. We've already done all the studies for this particular drug, amphotericin B, which I'm demonstrating here, which is needed for mycosis and which is also needed to treat leishmaniasis, a disease that afflicts the poor population. And today it's so unaffordable and the affordable version is so toxic. So here we have something that we can actually use for human therapy made so simply. And we have one more outcome because today we're talking about the ripple effect. I told you that these intracellular infections are predominant in the veterinary population. So we 
are looking at teleriosis, we are looking at brucellosis and a number of other infections. So this is the formulation I talked about for teleriosis, which was again made with the beaker and glass rod technology. So we took buparvacone, we took a low cost lipid plus stabilizers and other excipients, just dissolved it by stirring, filtered it. So these are all things that we understand we can just do very easily. Filtered it, filled it into vials, and that vial you'll see here how a veterinary doctor is taking it, putting it into dextrose injection. Here we needed more dilution, so this is almost 500 ml of dextrose into which he puts. Just see how quickly the nano formulation forms, and more than 98% of the drug is in the particles. It's not in the liquid, it's in the particles, which is very important. And this he injects intravenously into that animal. So you will see him actually injecting it into the animal also. He's taking the needle, he pokes the needle first, they have their method and then they attach this. So you will see him poking the needle, he's done that. Now he's going to attach this there. So here he's attaching it. And this is a product which we have the patent granted, the product is licensed, and what you see here is the proposed product of this drug, which we hope would be launched early 2025. So this is one product, but we have studied this technology for almost 11 to 12 products, and we continue to do that with many more drugs, even currently in the lab. And we hope with this technology to really have what TEDx today is talking about the ripple effect and percolate nanomedicine for all those who need it, like the Android mobile phone. Thank you.